Greetings, everybody. John Prusak here from Snowgoer Magazine. We certainly hope your winter is starting out well. We are now just about nine days as we record this from the start of the Eagle River World Championship Snowmobile Derby, and that gets us excited here at the home office. And somebody who shares my excitement for oval racing is right next to me here on this video screen, Brett Richter, for live from his office in Ironwood, Michigan. How are you doing today, Brett? Doing fantastic, John. How about you? I'm doing pretty good. So, um... Your history with oval racing is, is longer than mine, although you know, I know you share my passion for it. Why don't you share with our viewers uh, kind of how you got into this whole game? Yeah, it started off kind of a, it was a little bit of a mess, I think. I was a young kid, and we lived about a mile and a half from the Ironwood Olympus. Okay. My dad happened to be a volunteer over there, and being a, a young boy with his dad, you wanted to do what dad did. So I tended to tag along a lot. Uh, one day I found myself kind of hiding behind the tires of the Polaris trailer, hoping to get Bob Eastman's autograph. Nice. Uh, his, aut his autograph hung on my bedroom wall for, gosh, I bet 10 years. And I was hooked on uh, oval snowmobile racing ever since then. Uh, years went by, and then I got involved again with the Ironwood Olympus as an adult and volunteer and helped run some things down there. Through that association, I met Todd Octoberg and spent the last four years working on the TLR Cup Tour. So I've been uh, real close to ice oval racing the past 10 years and uh, have a, quite a history with it. And now I understand your, your history, though. As interesting as it is in snowmobile now, started on the dirt track, right? Yeah, I actually, um, I'm, I'm a motorsports junkie. So, you know, any, anything that uh, burns burns gas and air and turns it into noise and adrenaline, I'm all about it. I've been to car races and motorcycle races and boats and ATVs and, and you name it, IndyCar, NASCAR, whatever it is. Um, and But in in, uh, in the early 90s, I saw an ad for the company looking for a snowmobile journalist. And I uh, practically burst down to the, the front door and uh, came in and got the job. Um, but, uh, so my history with, with Eagle river or with oval racing doesn't go back as far as yours. My first one was in 1994. Um, but I've now been to 24, the last 26. Um, and the other two, then the two I missed, I was on assignment covering some other motorsports events. So it's, uh, of all the motorsports stuff I've been to, I'm a big world of all a sprint car fan. I, I really enjoy a lot of different things, but my number one thing, my jam is Eagle river. That is the number one, uh, weekend of the year for me and not not so coincidentally the uh the person who uh wins the the, the world championship gets their name written on the snowgoer cup we uh right. be the snow week cup when i started and snow week magazine may may it rest in peace uh, uh <laughs> failed to make money and uh, we had to make some tough decisions there and and uh even though i you know i know not all snowmobilers are as into racing as i am so we don't cover it a lot in snowgoer with our website, we do, and a lot of that is just because of my own passion for it. I, I absolutely love it. Um, it's it's just uh, it's just my jam, like I said. So um, I know you were in Ironwood this last weekend when the USSA kicked off their season. Uh, what, what were some highlights? What are some things that stick with you? Ironwood was really – Saturday was a great race day in Ironwood. It really was. Um, with the new formula, uh, three class showing up there with the – Pro Champ class showing up there. Uh, there was a lot of great racing. The first thing I have to say, though, is the past couple of years, Ironwood has always posed a challenge for the drivers because it seems like we would lose some due to injury on that weekend. Yeah. And they wouldn't make it to Eagle River. A couple of years ago, it was Matt Ritchie's shoulder. Um, we had the uh, the Stevenson and uh, Gady incident. Um, right. Most recently, I remember Dustin Wall going into turn three in the bales and uh, getting a concussion. And uh, Joey Fierstead popped his shoulder out. And all those uh, drivers were lost for the season. I was ecstatic this year when the ambulance never moved for a champ race. <laughs> so it was it was really a good weekend. Uh, it was also interesting to see the the pro light class running on the same day as the new pro champ class, knowing that some of those guys are now headed to the WC field uh, in the pro champ class. So it was right. really a really a strong weekend. The ones you expected to be good were good. Uh, Gunnar Stern, Blaine Stevenson, Nick Van Strydock. Uh, right where you expected them to be in the finish of most of the races. Then there were some surprises. Uh, Matt Gady shows up on a champ sled that Dale Ritz has his hands on. And all of a sudden, Matt Gady wins a couple of heats and comes in third in the final. Um, Brent Great Miller, which I think is little, Oh, yeah, it was fantastic. Uh, his, his dad, too, is, is just a, a great guy and really knows his stuff. So to have him around the track is, is also a benefit. Uh, to see Brent Miller on a pro light sled with, I think, aspirations to be in the WC this coming week, uh, really did well in the pro light class. So the racing was really good, really strong. Um, 
a lot of guys testing, and, and I think everybody knows that because Ironwood's the week before the World Championship. Um, but the race was really strong, really competitive, and uh, I think it really bodes well for what's coming here in Eagle River in a couple of weeks. And for those who don't know, um, it ended up being just a one-day program because you had some weather move in, correct? There was some weather that moved in Sunday morning. The biggest, the bigger issue, I think, really was track condition. Uh, Ironwood hosted a, a vintage race the weekend prior to the regular two-day Ironwood Snowmobile Olympus. And then they did a full day of practice on Friday. And not a full day, they did three hours of practice on Friday. And then all the classes. And uh, the track just kind of took its toll. And they, they really lost three and four down on the bottom. And okay. without enough of a groove down there. And the snow dust and stuff, the safety issue just kind of came into play and was probably enough for the weekend. It was the right call. It's one of the things that's unique about our sport. It's just, well, I suppose it's not unique because you've got Daytona in, in NASCAR, but to have our world championship, our most high profile race this early in the season, you get, you get years like this and the guys haven't had a lot of track time. And, and this year we have the new classes and things like that, that even make it more of a, of a twist, but still it's exciting. It's, it's setting up to be a really exciting year. I agree with that a hundred percent. The, some of the people that you, you expect to be good because they have experience in what is now the, the champ 440 class, the old class just didn't quite seem to have the stuff like they've had it before. You know, there, there's a little less horsepower, a little less engine under the hood. So the handling's a little different. The clutching's a little different and all the things that they've known for the past three or four years just don't quite play like they used to. And yeah. some of the guys moving up from pro champ have the experience with these engines and have the experience with the handling and the setup. So all of a sudden they're a little bit more competitive than other people would expect them to be. I, the Eagle River weekend is going to be a lot about who's got the right number at the right time. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's jump into the rules uh, because a lot of people may not be aware of all the changes that have been going on in, in the various classes. So um, a couple of big changes were made in oval racing this year. Um, both of them were kind of aimed at a getting some of the money out of the sport, uh, the expense that the, uh, that the race teams have to spend to be competitive. And then the second one was made uh, to also try to get more, um, support from the manufacturers as well as other sponsors. So I'll cover these once at a time. Uh, so for this year, the World Championship class is called Pro Champ. It's the same chassis that, that you race fans have seen out there since it was, what, 1998, we went to Champ 440. So it's the same chassis, except you can't use exotic materials. So the, the titanium studs, the carbon fiber backers, those are out of it. The traction control, that's out of it. And uh, also, the engine rules were tightened up. So you can you can do some cylinder head work, you can do uh, aftermarket exhaust, but the, the cylinders have to remain the same and you can't do a lot, of, a lot inside the block. So a lot of the exotic motors are gone, that takes out some of the expense. And really, you know, from what you saw on the track, the speeds really, looking at them, they're not slower per se, they're running very close uh, times as some of the money's come out, correct? Right. I don't think the casual observer, maybe even a seasoned observer, can tell a difference between, you know, 98 miles an hour in the straightaway or 94 miles an hour in the straightaway at Ironwood. Right. There just isn't that much difference. When I spoke with Gunnar Stern, he said uh, in his Champ 440, his older sled, he could pull 103, maybe 104 in the straightaway. He's getting 97, 98 miles an hour. That's yeah. not a noticeable enough difference for anybody who's watching. They're still going by you at such a rapid pace. You, you can't tell that difference. So, yeah. But from a cost standpoint, it's allowed some of these other smaller teams to all of a sudden step up with the dream of a world championship becoming maybe more than just a dream, which is really kind of an exciting thing for the sport in general. Yeah, that is. And I think that's why we're going to see a lot of these pro light racers bump up, but we'll cover that in a minute. So again, the world championship for this year is Pro Champ, and that's a 440cc engine with the Champ chassis. So for next year, the world championship class is a new class, although the name's going to sound familiar to long-time old racing right. fans, is called Formula 3. So what they did there is they took uh, the basically the 600-class snowcross sleds, and they're allowing these guys with open suspension rules, or rather open, to suck these things down close to the ice. You can run you know, a, a wall rear suspension and design a front suspension for this. You can, um, you can cut off the back of the tunnel and have it be straight, unlike the snowcross sleds that have this big kicker at the back. And then the engine rules for that are going to be pretty dang tight. It's going to be, it's going to mirror the snowcross uh, rules for pro class where you can run an aftermarket silencer, but you can't do anything internal to the engine. So it's, it's, again, it's going to take some money out. And also um, it's going to make the sleds look like more like snowmobiles that you see on the trail. It's going to tie in the, the brands better. It's getting some limited support from the snowmobile manufacturers this very first year and is hoping to grow. Um, 
again, a uh, pretty controversial change. Some of the teams weren't super excited about it, although everyone knew the money had to come out of the sport. But now that they've been on the track, they've been incredible to watch. I mean, again, talk about what you saw at Ironwood as, as far as how these guys were uh, were driving these things. It was really interesting. The uh, yeah. The Formula 3, when it comes up to the line, has this heavier uh throated kind of a just a a louder deeper sound to it it's got kind of an kind of an exciting sound it doesn't quite have the whine of the 440 if you know what i mean by that kind of yep. a sound that, that high pitch it just has more of a muscle sound to it and a muscle feel uh when they leave the starting line the the key to this formula three in the future is going to be who can control the traction yeah. almost everybody side by side spins on the line and there's just a rooster tail of ice picks coming out behind them because they just can't get that much power to the to the track and hold on to the traction I actually had a good conversation with Travis McDonald about his new F3. And by the end of the weekend in Ironwood, he actually said, I really like driving it, which I think is yeah. not something the drivers expected. But he yeah. also said that the pull out of turn two and out of turn four is almost the same pull you feel at the starting line, that it sets them back in their seat. It's got mm -hmm. that much power, you know, when they get back on the gas coming down the straightaways. So the, the racing was really for the first competitive race package like that, I thought it was very, very close. I, uh, after Beauchesur, I spoke with both uh, Gunnar Stern and Blaine Stevenson, and they were saying the same thing, that you could really feel the torque of the engine um, coming out of the turns. And it, uh, it was uh, thrilling and surprising in a sense uh, that, yeah, it, it set them back in their seats and uh, squashed some of that uh, seat foam a little bit. Um, you know, some some people when the rule change was first made were like, oh, we're going to stock, it's going to be slower, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, you're also gaining 160 cc. So, you know, once they get these things pulled down to the ice, which some of the teams have done a fantastic job doing, these are going to be fast, fast machines. They're right now within five miles an hour of the champ sleds. Yeah. So they're they're already making really good speed. Yeah, and at Beauchesur, I, um, I think somebody was clocked at 103. Uh, you wow. know, there's some pretty long straights up there. But uh, and and the the initial concern in talking to some some friends in the sport were like, oh boy, you know, they, yeah, they'll go fast, but are they going to be able to get those things to go around turns? Since they start as a snowcross sled, well, they're getting them to go around turns. They are, they are. It'll be interesting to see because when I looked at one up close this past weekend, the driver's ability to see across the hood when they are arced in the corner, you know, the driver's so far off the side of the sled that the higher hood profiles from these new these these new hood designs don't allow them great vision across the front of the hood. So it's going to make for a little bit of a different racing feel, I think, for the driver to have somewhat more limited visibility as they're, as they're cornering, with, especially with competitors on their outside. Yeah. Yeah, and, and again, uh, just watching, I, you know, I haven't seen it in person. I've just seen some of the video from Beauchesur and then also seeing some of the video from, from Ironwood where you were, and it was, it was really exciting racing. And they were running in a pack. I mean, they were pretty evenly matched at times, and it was... Uh, I'm, I'm excited for it. So, so this year, um, fans are going to be able to see the some of the top the race the some of the top names in the sport um, race more than once a weekend. Um, you know, so many of the guys now they just specialize. They work on their champ sled or you know the world championship class, and that's the only time you see them all weekend. Where now these guys are also running Formula Three. There's some money on the line. There's some pride on the line. There's some testing or when that does become the world championship class. And it's an opportunity to, I guess, flash back to the nineties uh, when you used to see some of the top names run, you know, some of the stock classes or mod classes or sprint classes, and then still come out and race formula one or whatever. So to me that, that adds to the show as well. But this is also uh, this is cutting edge for these drivers because these drivers are very one class drivers. Their, yeah. their history, the past five years or eight years is running one class, even pro light has gotten that way because they don't jump on an F500 sled and then jump into a pro light sled. They run their one class a couple times a day. And then I would, with some scheduling things that came up, F3 was backed up to the champ class. So there, yeah. were, there were guys coming in off a of champ sled, you know, they'd get five, eight, 10 minutes and they were back on that F3 going back out and running again. So I, I talked to uh, Travis and Gunner a little bit about conditioning and I won't say they'd say it's an issue, but it's a known factor to say, this isn't just a walk in the park here. You're just not going out and driving your, your trail sled around mom's field for an hour. This actually yeah. work. And, and for the record, you know, at the world championship, they're not going to run the formula threes immediately, you know, final, right. Immediately in front of the world championship, but you're right over the course of the weekend, you know, in, in one sense, these guys will get more track time. So that's right. an interesting twist. Um, and like I said, it's fabulous for the fans. Um, but 
also, yeah, I think conditioning by the end of the weekend, how, how some of these guys wear after lap, after lap, after lap on two different sleds is, is going to be interesting. Mm-hmm. So let's, uh, let's have a little bit of fun here. Uh, oh. you for a fantasy draft, my friend? Sure, why not? <laughs> okay, so let's let's do this. So um, let's each pick. We'll take turns. I'll let you go first since you're my guest. We're each going to pick three drivers. So in the, in the first round, you pick a guy, and then I pick a guy. We'll go back and forth. And so this is who's going to win the world championship this year. And then after we set those guys, we'll um, each pick a couple more guys that we think will make uh, the front row in the final. So be my guest, Mr. Brett. Uh, what do, who do you think is going to be our 2020 Eagle River world champion? So my guess is you and I probably have the same two guys at the top of the list. And I'll probably have to flip a coin and pick one. So if I'm going to flip simply because I think the three-peat is, much, is as much psychological as it is impractical, I'm going to take Gunnar Stern as my number one pick okay. on the 220 skidoo. All right. You, 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 you could certainly do worse than Gunner. I mean, that, that yeah. guy, you know, a defending points championship a couple of years in a row and stuff. And uh, he's, he's obviously every, so fast every year. So, so I can see why you made that pick, but boy, leaving the two time defending world champion uh, for me. Thank you. Thank you very yes. much. He, uh, you know, you look at it and, you know, his victory two years ago, uh, you know, a lot of flukes happened on those last couple laps and stuff. But last year, Blaine Stevenson went out there and he earned it on his 102 uh, Polaris uh, from Wall. And um, this year, you know, he won at Beauchesure. He won at Ironwood. He's, he's been doing really good. You're right. The three-peat factor is, uh, is certainly no one's ever done. You know, he's already right. got his name in history, but this would be the first ever three-peat. And that's, that's not easy. Um, obviously cause it hasn't been done, but, um, I, I actually just cause I'm a, I'm a wonk about statistics and stuff. He won three consecutive titles at Eagle river back in the F 500 days. Um, oh. I, I'm looking back through my notes. So, um, he has raced the same class three years in a row and won at Eagle river. Now there's certainly a difference between F 500 and the world championship, but pretty composed kid, even though he is what, 22 years old. Right. Um, okay. yes. So I will, uh, first round. Put me down for Blaine Stevenson. Back to you, sir. All right. Um, I'm going to throw you a loop on this one. Um, okay. Nick Van Strax, one of my good friends and uh, somebody that I've, I've really come to respect. He's done great things for the sport. But I'm going to put Matt Gady as my next uh-huh. driver out there. Um, okay. I struggled with this a ton, but um, I followed Matt for a number of years. I've seen him in the vintage world. He came up and raced vintage when I was helping with the Ironwood Olympus. Um I've, uh, I've followed him. I covered him in Buffalo River when he came out to run champ on uh, one of Gary Moyle's sleds. And uh, I watched him in Ironwood. He won two heats. He finished third in the final on a sled he hadn't been on. Wow. And I just think that uh, Matt's got some driving skill that is not taught. It's not, you can't buy it. You can't do anything. It's just natural and it's a gift. And he also has Dale Ritz in the trailer. And you know, Dale's got a lot of knowledge and uh, a lot yeah. of just a lot of experience. So, uh, sorry, Nick, I'm going to take Matt Gady for my second pick. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, Matt, for those who don't know, uh, had a horrific injury here a couple of years ago at Ironwood. And uh, and so this is his comeback season. And so he'll be a sentimental favorite of, of many of us. And uh, it's great to have him back. Uh, I have a kind of a, a somewhat of a family connection to the Gates in that uh, his brother races the same racetrack with some of my cousins and they've become good friends and, and stuff. So, uh, um, you know, part of me will be cheering for Mr. Gady, but yes, you left me, Nick Vance dried up, you know, uh, uh, a little known fact, I don't know, it sound like Cliff Clavin, but the last five years in a row, Nick Vance Strydunk has been on the podium. The I last five years he's gone third, First, second, second. Well, wait, I'm leaving out a third, second, first, second, second. Um, so, you know, this is a guy, and even last year, if, if you know, people will, will think back, I mean, he was right on Blaine Stevenson's snow flap when his track partially derailed, and he had to kind of give it a, a jerk and a quarter to put it back uh, on the drivers. But, but this is a guy who knows that Eagle River track so well, a two-time world champion, and as you said, he's, he's hanging it up after this. Um, allegedly, I part of me hopes not, though I hope he reconsiders. Um, and the other thing I really like that that TN TNN team he races for, you know, what a class group, you know. Right, right when the, the rules changed this last spring, and and some of the teams were kind of lashing out at the rule changes and stuff. After that, I spoke to the TN guys, and they said, you know, 
did we agree with everything in the new rules package? Well, no, it may not be exactly what each one of us wanted, but once the decision was made, we got 100% behind it and we're promoting it. And that to me is the best thing people can do for the sport. You know, if rule changes are always tough, fight like hell beforehand, but once the change is made, jump in with both feet and support it. And they did it. Um, love that team, love that driver. Watch out for number 13, uh, Polaris out of Tomahawk, Wisconsin. All right, third round to you. Yeah, well, let me just follow up on Nick quick. Nick and his and Al, his dad, I don't know that um, there was sometimes a better hauler for me to take visitors or guests to when I was working with the yeah. TLR Cup Tour. Um, just a top-notch support, supporter of the sport, promoter. Uh, they do school visits if you ask them to. They'll go in and talk to little kids about racing and about snowmobiles and all those types of things. I actually stopped at their trailer before they left Ironwood for the last time this past weekend and talked to them. And I, I could see it in Big Al's eyes, you know, that it was just one of those moments that he didn't want to see come, but it was there. So I, as much as I wouldn't want to see Nick leave the sport, you know, he's now happily married and yeah. I think there's a future in some other areas he'd like to pursue. So um, I'd love to see him win, but if we're picking, I'm picking and that's where I went. So all right, uh, I'm going to go, this one may surprise you a little bit. I'm going to take Travis McDonald. Nice. What I saw from, uh, from MPH, M MPH racing in Ironwood this past weekend. I think the, the pro light motor in their chassis helped them more than almost any other team. Uh, I saw speed out of there. They had a little trouble getting out of the hole, but um, he had three seconds in all of his heats. And I, I just think that that package suits that team and Travis is a driver better than the package maybe suits some other people that I see out there. So okay. uh, I'm going to give Travis a legitimate shot this year to, to potentially be, be the winner of that, that race. And, you know, and as you know, they, you know, that's, that's a, that's a team with a world championship pedigree as well with uh, right. Mr. Brian Busick, uh, part of that whole scene and stuff. So they certainly know how to, you know, make a, a sled go fast. Travis has won a lot of places over the years. Mm -hmm. uh, he's really been snake bit at Eagle River um, and has, has I, I don't know if he's finished on the podium once, but he certainly has the talent. He has, the, you know, a, a great team behind him. And so, yeah, maybe this is the year that uh, T-Mac is the guy. So yeah. we'll, we'll see. All right. So this is, leaves me with the final pick of our uh, of our uh, three. You know what? I'm, I'm going for a little bit of a wild card here. I'm, I'm going with the wild child, Mr. Nick Lagoy out of New York. <laughs> you know? Um, he has had some fast equipment under him in the last few years. Uh, there was a little incident last year that, uh, that took him out to, of the event, um, but he's back. He's determined. He's, uh, he's, he's in great shape. He's, uh, you know, he's, he's the kind of guy that could come out there and win it. And if he would win it, um, he would be the first Articat since, because he's using Articat power this right. year, mm -hmm. since I think uh, um, PJ won his fourth. Um, I think okay. he'd be the first one from then, and he'd be the first uh, Eastern racer since Larry Day. So that would be a, a big accomplishment, and uh, Nick is certainly determined. So uh, third round, Nick Lagoy from this guy. So uh, right. I was in with, oh, go I was ahead. with Nick. Um, he has all the driving ability in the world. If he can get his head wrapped around the mental aspect of Absolutely. the competition, you know, and know when you push and know when you don't push and um, – it's it's just it's it's one of those things where there's two really good pieces of a puzzle there, and they just haven't quite fit together. And when they do, I really think he's got some some really good potential there. It's just a yeah. matter of making that that mental aspect and the physical aspect work together. Off the top of my head, I can't remember where he got his win last year, but I mean, he's uh, uh, he's certainly not a complete dark horse. I mean, he won one of the races last year on the Pro Star Cup, and so he's he's again a talented driver on good equipment. But I completely agree with you. Yeah, um, you know, once he gets the mental aspect of it nailed, uh, he's he's got all the talent in the world. He can do this. Yep. All agree. right. So so uh, now, um, one thing that you and I discussed off air is the fact that this field could be really deep this year with uh, with all the pro light guys coming up. I mean, we we were able to put together a list of like twenty six drivers that could be there, and some derby folks are saying there could be over thirty entries in the world champ championship class this year. That That's means fantastic. the races mean something. The quarterfinals mean something. It is going to be a lot of fun coming through. It's not going to be you know, a bunch of heat races to knock the field from 15 drivers down to 12 for the final. This is going to be real all weekend. So with that, give me two other guys that are going to make the uh, the front row in, uh, in Eagle River this year. I'm going to give you one that's been on it before and one that's going to be brand new after okay. thinking about it. I'm going to give Stephen Marquis one of those spots up there on the front yeah. row. He showed it last year. Yeah, he did. Uh, 
He's got some good equipment. I, I simply don't know how he's going to handle the pro light style motor with the chassis if there's a big adjustment or if he's had some ice time and some practice. But if he comes prepared like he usually does, I think he can have one of those spots. I'm going to give the yeah. second spot to Brent Miller, which is probably a name people wow. are going for. Yeah. Um, Brent came up and he ran the pro light class on Saturday. He didn't run the champ class, but he ran the pro light class. One of those heat races, he was a third of a lap at Ironwood ahead after five Holy laps. cow. He was leading the final and then got snake bitten by the broken ski loop rule, and they DQ'd oh, him yeah. and ended up. He, was, he he was listed last for the race, but was by no means last. Um, and Brent's got a ton of laps in Eagle River. He ran okay. a lot of the vintage stuff, the IFS 250, 340, 440 classes. So he's been around that track as many times as a lot of our champ drivers have been around it. On the right piece of equipment, I think he's got the skill to actually make something happen. So it would not surprise me in the least to see him on the front row. Nice. The uh, yeah, a lot of people when they think about oval racing, they just think of the guys that uh, guys and girls that maybe we see on uh, race weekends uh, for the the late model stuff. But yeah, a lot of those vintage guys, they have a lot of talent down there. And you know that's yeah. where Katie came from. You even go back to Glenn Hart and some of the other guys that have come up through the system. They aren't mm -hmm. coming up through F five hundred and you know semi pro champ and stuff. They're coming up. They're learning their their, their craft. On videos, right. which is which is rather interesting but uh interesting pick I, I i honestly like that pick that's pretty dang good and not someone that a lot of people would have thought of i've even heard of people like um keith wojo possibly being in a in a champ class and uh warren leba some of those guys that okay. have some vintage roots from up in the canada area also potentially running champs so what, what you're saying from the vintage world is, is really quite true and if, if this new rule package makes that happen that's all the better for it Absolutely. I know Wojo has a uh, Formula 3 sled that he's uh, got built, but I don't know if he's doing Pro Champ, but I guess we'll, we'll, you know, time will tell because he's, he's certainly brought out, been out there before. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, and there are some sleds sitting around that I think some people are going to want to, hey, this is the last year where it's a world championship. So if I got a sled, I can put a driver on and Wojo is a, a tough dude. He could, he could <laughs> muscle it around there. So, you know, who knows? So, yeah. I keep so there's, there's two right. spots left on the front row. I'm going to give those to you, right? Yeah, that's why I keep glancing down on my list here. Okay, so I'm going to I'm gonna start with um, a guy that I was thinking of taking for my third pick and kind of feel guilty about not taking, but I already had two Polaris guys, so I went with Nick Lagoy, uh, Tom Olson. Um, you know, the, the, the Wall Brothers team uh, that he races for, um, you know, great pedigree there. Uh, maybe his teammates uh, more or less with Stevenson, although Stevenson isn't necessarily 100% out of the wall trailer. He's so closely tied to the, to the wall brothers team. Um, and the other thing that, that, uh, you know, if, if you think about it, you know, the last time we had a, a, a rule change that was notable in the, in the premier class was when we went from formula one to, to, uh, to champ 440. When that happened, the last two years of formula one was Dave wall. The first year of champ 440 was Terry wall, the, the trophy sure. went to green Bush, Minnesota. Maybe Tom Olson is the guy that can uh, make that happen again. Um, you know, Younger racer, still cutting his teeth, but he's got great equipment, and let's see what he can do. And he's looked really good on his uh, Formula 3 sled, by the way. And right. then yeah. let's go with John Hankey. Uh, John Hankey, a uh, racer out of uh, Amherst Junction, Wisconsin. Um, he finished fifth last year in the World Championship. A lot of people don't remember that. And, and by the way, your pick, uh, Marquis, he finished fourth last year in the World Championship. So we're we're uh, not exactly picking dark horses there. Uh, these are guys that, uh, you know, qualified for the World Championship, ran strong, you know, got through the field, through some attrition from some other racers and finished well. And so as far as making it to that front row again, I'll, I'll go with Mr. Hankey. Um, have you seen John Sled this year? Um, I have not. Wait till you see it. Yeah. It's a beautiful piece of work. It's just really? gorgeous. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. It's from a pure look standpoint, he's probably got the nicest looking sled out there this year. There was a photographer uh, out of Beauchajur who sent me some pictures from that race weekend. And uh, um, I'll have to go back through those and uh, look for Mr. Hankey's sled. He was not in Beauchajur. He was in Ironwood, but he didn't make okay. a trip. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, then I guess I won't look for it there. So while we're at it, um, Formula Three. Just give me, give me a pick. Give me one person who who is going to win Formula Three at Eagle River this year. Oh man, um, I got to look over the list again. Yeah, I, you know, I think your pick of Tom Olson as you know one of the people for the front row is probably my pick for the Formula Three run. Okay, uh, Tom looked good on there. 
Uh, Travis McDonald was on his really for the first time. Uh, Gunner and Nick had been up in Beausjour and run theirs a little bit. Uh, but Tom really looked good, looked comfortable maybe is a better term for it. Okay. Maybe maybe his lack of champ experience makes him you know not as set in his ways as to the driving style that some of these other champ guys that are so used to one type of machine yeah. comes into play. It'll be interesting, too, because at the Ironwood race, there are a number of Myra drivers over here. There yeah. was, uh, I think we had eight in the final for Formula 3, and only four of them was, were champ drivers. So if any of those drivers make a run to Eagle, I think all bets are off in that class. Anybody could come out of there. Yeah, you know, I, I wasn't even thinking that, but you know, after after you took Tom, I immediately thought, well, then I'll take Gunner, uh, because you know, basically at uh, at uh, Ironwood, it was you know, Tom was winning and and Stern was second. Um, but you're right, uh, it's how do you turn away from Troy DeWald? I mean, you want to right. talk about an experienced racer? You know, this guy's won the Sioux, he's done it all. Um, you know, he won uh, you know a lot of vintage classes at Eagle River over the years and stuff as well. Um, I'll I'll stick with I'll stick with Gunner though for second. Um, but, uh, part of me is thinking, uh, don't sell Mr. DeWald short. I would agree with that hundred percent after watching him run. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, we'll kind of wrap it up here, folks. We really appreciate you joining us. Um, the, the, again, the Eagle River world championship is, uh, January 17th or yeah, 17th to the 19th. So about nine days away from nine, 10 days away from when we're taping this, uh, both Brett and I will be there. So if you see us, give us a hearty wave and uh, yell at us over the fence or whatever. Um, Friday night thunder program kicks it off they They change when they're, they're qualifying the world championship. They're actually doing that under the lights now on Saturday night, which makes, uh, the racing really exciting and makes my job for getting stories on our website really difficult. You know, it, it's not all about me sometimes. It's not about uh, you, John. <laughs> yeah, dang it. it should be. But, uh, so, uh, but over the weekend, check out snowgoer.com all weekend for race results and updates and things like that. We'll also be pushing some stuff on social media. And then we'll have full, you know, coverage on our website after the races. Um, and as long as I'm plugging things here, uh, we have our fa Snowmobile Fantasy Racing Challenge game on snowgore.com. It's free to enter. You just, you go on there and you use these little pull-down windows and you pick the top five racers in order, how you think they're going to finish. And you get points based on how they actually finish. Uh, so it's easy, it's free, it's fun. And this year we have a sponsor in More Freaking Power. So the winner is going to get a $40 gift certificate from uh, More Freaking Power. So we're, we're doing this all season in uh, Pro Star Cup races and uh, in Snowcross races. So you can play one round, you can play the entire season, whatever works. Um, one last thing, if you kind of like what we've done here with the video, uh, leave some comments below and, and let us know if you want to see some more of this or a different format. Brett, thank you so much for joining us. And you know, I, I, uh, part, part of this idea was hatched out of the, what you used to do with Lindsay Fontaine with uh, the, the morning show uh, on the TLR Cup, which I was a uh, regular junkie watching. So uh, thanks again, and we will see you in about uh, nine or ten days. Sounds great. Look forward to it. Okay, thanks for watching, everybody.